On this Good Friday, I want to thank you for joining with me on our Side by Side. And if you've been following through since Christmas, uh, that's 13 weeks of our walking together. And I hope it's been a help to you and thank you for spending the time. You can share this with other people if you wish, if you think there's someone who might be helped by it. And these recordings stay up so that they can be listened to at another time. Today we're thinking about the subject of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It is Good Friday, and it is a time to reflect upon some of the most poignant moments in our Lord's life and ministry. But I want to begin by asking you a question. How do you feel about saying yes to the things that God says we should do? I think back to Genesis and how God gave to Adam and Eve very clear instructions as to what they could do and what they could not do. It was really a relationship of trust. And if Adam was to say yes to the things that God asked him to do, it was really a a source of delight and joy. You couldn't say anything else because he lived in a perfect world. It reminds me a little bit like going to the doctor And the doctor, having examined you, been able to diagnose correctly what the problem is, then writes a prescription, hands it to you, you you take it to the chemist, the chemist goes away and eventually they give you something. And there is a prescribed set of guidelines for you to follow, take this medicine in this fashion for this length of time. Most people, when they get that, are so glad. They realize this is the answer to my whatever it may be, this is going to help me. This is going to bring good into my life. Oh, I just can't wait. And so people are urgent about getting their prescriptions. You know, if they have to wait an extra few days, they're anxious about it. Well, that's what I think it was like for Adam. But can you imagine Adam then doing as he did, saying, well, do you know, I think I know better and I'm going to do something else. And of course, there are many people who, when they get their doctor's prescription, do exactly that. They take one tablet or they go away and they look up all the side effects and they say, well, no, I'm not going to take this at all because I'll get all the side effects. They leave the box in the cupboard. I'm sure there must be cupboards in the country that are full of unused medicines. In fact, I know that to be true because I've seen some of them. Well, That's the tragedy about obedience, and that's the tragedy about human nature. Because when the Lord asks us to do something, it will always be good. The Bible says that God is not the author of evil. He does not tempt anyone. God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect, is what Romans says. And so he's only ever going to ask us to do something that will be good and for our good. Now, it may be hard, it may be difficult, and it may be challenging. But of course, that's okay. Well, when you come to this passage in Luke chapter 22, and let's read it together. Here is Jesus' obedience. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now, in other records of the other Gospels, we know that Jesus then came back to the disciples, found them sleeping. That's Peter, James and John, because he had taken them with him to be close. But then... He went away again a second time and prayed. And then we read here, And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And he, being in an agony, prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. This is a most remarkable moment in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here in this garden of Gethsemane, surrounded by the ancient olive trees, His twelve, well, now his eleven disciples, the twelfth one has gone off to arrange for his betrayal. He tells them to pray, and then he kneels down and prays. How long Jesus prayed, we don't know. 
but we do know what he did pray. Now, remember that other man, Adam, in the perfect garden. Remember how he disobeyed the word of God and where it left us all. So here is Jesus, the second Adam, wrestling with the question of obedience. But of course, as we said, when Adam was wrestling with obedience, it was in the perfect word, in the perfect world, with the promise of everything good. Obedience was the pathway of joy and delight, and he chose to disobey. But here is Jesus, the second Adam. He is in this cursed world, around his knees may well have been the jagged thorns and thistles and the undergrowth, a reminder of the fallenness of the world, a reminder of what disobedience does. In the city of Jerusalem, just nearby, is the rebellious population who are trying to get rid of him, the expression of this disobedience towards God. So for for Jesus, obedience was going to lead him to the cross. Yes, there was joy beyond it, for we know that it was who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. But what a dark valley he has to travel before he arrives there. Now, when we draw on the other Gospels, we know that Jesus uh, prays and he comes to the disciples, he goes back again, and those words are used in different parts of the, the, the Gospels and in the epistles to describe Jesus at this time, distressed, troubled, agitated. He's deeply, deeply overwhelmed. There's a, a terror of sin and the judgment and the wrath of God. In John Stott's book, The Cross of Christ, which I could not commend more highly, he argues that it was never the physical brutality that made Jesus recoil. And he talks about the martyrs, many of the martyrs who almost run to their deaths and consider it an honour and a privilege and a delight, and whose faces shine often as they are facing the martyrs' experience. But when Jesus spoke of this cup, that's the word he used, the cup he had to drink, it wasn't, it wasn't the physical torture which, in the 2004 film of Mel Gibson, The Passion, you may remember that film, that that was the one thing that he really focused on, was just the pure physical brutality. But he missed the, he missed the whole point. The real point was, and to quote John Stott, the spiritual agony of bearing the sin of the world. As in some of the songs where wrath and mercy meet, or in the hymn in Christ alone, the wrath of God was satisfied. That's at the very core of all that's going on here. It is this that Jesus was saying yes to. This is what Jesus was obeying. Romans 5.19 puts it this way, For as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, should many be made righteous. So these 18 words in Greek that Jesus says that are summed up in that, not my will, but thine be done. He is saying, I will do your will. I will obey you. And even later, when Peter pulls out the sword, when those have gathered around to try to take him, the soldiers and Judas, Jesus says, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? This is the obedience of Jesus that reverses the disobedience of the first Adam. As a consequence of this obedience, everything good has been won for you and I. Oh, how we should thank him for it. How we should praise him for it. And also we should apply to our hearts this principle that when the Lord asks us to do something, it is a privilege to do it, even though it's hard. It will bring good. It's like the kind doctor's prescription. It is something always going to bring good. You ought never to be suspicious of God asking you to do something in his word. I know our old nature will still recoil from time to time. But as we understand, it's through this that we get freedom and blessing and joy. So may the Lord help you and I as we think about the will of God as it's revealed in Scripture to always run to do his will with gladness. Even when it may seem painful, hard and difficult, let's never run away. Let's remember Jesus 
not my will, but thine be done.